Uh, the pictures that you'll see tonight, shown by my husband John Rule in the middle there, uh, come from the archives of Plymouth State University. The Brown Company had always had a, a photographer, a company photographer, so they have literally thousands and thousands of old photographs from the mills. So the old ones you see are from Plymouth State University, and there's a website on there. If you want to see more, you can go on and look at them, and there's room for comments. So if you see your Uncle Cal in one of the pictures, you can write it in. That's my Uncle Cal, or whatever you want to say. Um, the newer pictures, either I took just snapshots of the people I interviewed, or they were taken by Eric Kaminsky. He took a lot of pictures of the demolition of the mills, and he takes pictures of the city as a whole. Uh, he lives up in Berlin. So uh, what I'm going to do is do a program that lasts about 45 minutes, and it's the voices of the people of Berlin. It's oral history. The little sheet that you got, John compiled, and that's the history of the Brown Company. And by coincidence, he's working on that up at the New Hampshire State uh, Historical Society. He, he went to volunteer, and they assigned him what? To the Brown Company archives. <laughs> so he's working on that, and he knows he's been learning a lot about how the Brown Company worked through the years. So what we hope is at the end, some of you will have stories to tell, or questions, or information to add to the pool as we uh, talk about this rich part of New Hampshire's history. You ready? Well, I am. At its height in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, more than 20,000 people made Berlin, New Hampshire their home. The thriving economy supported doctors, tailors, farmers, and music teachers. There were theaters, bars, dance studios, bowling alleys, and lots of churches. Russian Orthodox, the only one I think in the east, on the East Coast, certainly in New England. Have you seen it? You've got to go see it. There's one in Maynard Mass. There's one in Maynard Mass. They are very rare, and what a beautiful church if you ever get to see it. Russian Orthodox, Catholic, Lutheran, Episcopal, Baptist, Universalist, a synagogue. Berlin was considered one of the most progressive cities in the East. The first in New Hampshire to have street lights and a municipal water system in the Norwegian village. It was a vibrant city. It still is if you look closely and listen to the people, though its population is half what it once was and declining. Berlin is more than a city, it's an identity. But in the beginning, it was all woods. The first log drives took place in the 1850s. When logs filled the river, people knew it was sugaring season. At one time, 2,500 horses and 1,700 men worked in the woods around Parmachini Lake. At the height of demand between International Paper and Brown Company, they were hauling 5,000 cord a day to the mill. That mill was chewing it up, making paper seven days a week. The more they got, the more they wanted. For over a hundred years, logging and paper making were a way of life. It must have been great working in the woods, I said to Helen Burns, Lady Logger. I didn't see anything so great about it, she said. It was damned hard work. No wonder I got no back. Started out helping my father in the woods. He was my stepfather, really, but I called him my father. I said, Helen, what did you do? She said, I run the other end of the cross cut. A cross cut is one of those big two-man saws, or in this case, a man and a teenage.
teenage girl. One pulls one way, the other pulls the other way, and the tree comes down eventually. Take your shoes off if you're going to ride, Helen said. That was an old saying. You'd get tired and relax a little, and if your end went down, it would bind. She said, I heard that saying a good many times. Take your shoes off if you're going to ride. It was hard work, some dangerous. That's Helen in the red with her friend Joyce Gillespie and their little dog Tinker. She asked if I'd like to hear about the time she saved a man's life. I said I would. She said, we was up in, up in Jefferson cutting on the government land. Mr. Tyler had a pair of horses. We done the cutting and he done the hauling out with the horses on a scoop. They built a big road with, underneath the skidway so they could drive the truck under and roll <coughs> the logs from the skidway onto the truck. Mr. Tyler one day was taking the logs off in the skidway. He climbed on to free a log that was hung up and all of a sudden the logs behind him started to let go. She said, well, I grabbed a cat dog and I drove it into the log he was holding on to and I held those logs back till he could pull himself out of the way. She said, he was the nicest old man you'd ever want to meet just as gentle as he could be. Boy, when I let them logs go, and that whole skinway come down through there, would have squished him to death. Afterwards, he thanked me, told everybody he knew how I saved his life. You didn't think anything of it at the time, but I did think of it years later. I was scared to death. When I jumped in there by side of him to hold them logs, I had no idea if I could do it or not. We could have both been killed on the spot. I tell you, when he got out of there and I let go and them logs come down through, there was quite a bang. She said, it's strange how things will happen. At the time, you don't realize what you've done. You see it and you have to do it. He could jump like a rabbit for a man his age. He was very limber on his feet. He was an elderly man, so we always called him Mr. Tyler. If he would have said to call him Clarence, I would have, but he never did. That's Helen, a wonderful storyteller. In 2007, I spent 40 days and 40 nights, give or take, in Berlin, collecting stories. One led to another. I heard the voices of the North Country, Yankee drawls, Norwegian lilts, the musical French inflections, hint of an Irish brogue. Berlin's heritage is English, Norwegian, French, Danish, Irish, Scot, Lebanese, Greek, Jewish, Italian, Russian. They came from Canada and they came from Europe to work in the woods and the mills, or to offer services to the workers. In the 1920s, Berlin's papermaking complex was the largest in the world. The largest in the world. Chains and logs ran between the boom piers that made a floating fence separating the logs of the Brown Company from the logs belonging to international paper. The piers that anchored those logs are still there. You can see them, stone on the bottom and wood on top. Only the stone, oh, there's a close-up of one. Only the stone remains, a series of small islands in the Androscoggin. At Halloween, fires are lit on what's left of the piers, and the river glows. Just about everybody you meet in Berlin has some connection to lumbering in the mills, if not in this generation, then another. Odette Leclerc said, my brothers, and sis my brothers and sister and I were all born at the end of the year. I think it had something to do with mud season. <laughs> <laughs> my father, he was a lumberjack and he worked in the woods. Mud season around February, March, whenever it came, they were laid off for three weeks. My brother and I were born end of November, 
My sister, end of December, draw your conclusions. <laughs> this is Odette at the Moffat House Historical Society where she volunteers. And if you saw the PBS show at the River's Edge, Odette was a star in that TV star now. Uh, beside her is a doll dressed in the uniform of the Joliet Snowshoe Club. When Odette was a little girl, she watched the drum and bugle corps of the Snowshoe Club on parade. She said it was an inspiring spectacle. The lively music, the marchers in their beautiful uniforms, the graceful majorettes with their tall hats, and out in front one little girl led them all. She got to wear a uniform too, just like the grown-ups. Odette says, I wanted to be that little girl. <laughs> Ola Olson spoke with great pride about his father, Alton Olson. Ola said, my father's first job in the bog brook was loading logs that were bigger around than they were long. Huge spruce and pine in Kennebago, opening up the Crowley Brook. This was in the 1950s. They found the king's stamp on some of the pines. The, yeah, the king's stamp. That meant these were mass trees, marked for, mass trees marked for the king of England and his sailing ships. So the marks dated to before the Revolutionary War. He said, another one of my father's jobs was pick and rear. If the booms separated and the logs went in the wallows, he had to fetch them back. He was rugged. They were all rugged. They were big, strong fellas. In College Grant, they found the Norwegian hand carved in a stone. Do you know the Norwegian hand? Thumb and forefinger extended the sign that somebody had died on that spot. So when the lumbermen died, they would carve this symbol, the spot, marking the spot where they died. Ola said, the Norwegians came first, squareheads like me. The French came later. Lord, his mother said, the woods were full of them. <laughs> Here's Ola and Norma at their home in Norwegian village. Norma said, the men would work all winter in just the one set of clothes until they were falling off them, and in the spring, peel down, buy new, start again. One night, her husband, Alton, she said, was trying to sleep in the cabin with a bunch of other river drivers, and the smell of all those dirty, wet wool socks hung from the rafters to dry got to be too much for him. He pulled them all down and burned them in the wood stove. <laughs> I said, what did they do for socks after that? She said, I guess they had to buy new ones at the Brown Company store. Yes, the Brown Company store, famous. That was where the mill workers and the loggers bought all their gear and food, whatever they needed. This was a company town. When people speak of the heyday of the mills, they speak of the Browns, beginning with W.W. W. Brown, who bought controlling interest in 1868. The Browns ran the mills and ran them well until the Depression and bankruptcy. The new stockholders were banks, insurance companies, about half of them were Canadian. The Brown family lost ownership, but they continued to help with management because, as one man said, they were good, capable people. No one that I found in Berlin has a bad word to say about the Browns. The mill workers worshipped them. Carolyn Lewis Gordon, who became Mrs. O.B. Brown, was from Atlanta, Georgia. And in one of these programs, uh, um, uh, uh, Kelly, what's his name? A man named Kelly from Berlin stood up and said, did you realize she was the daughter of a Confederate general, a famous Confederate, Confederate general named Gordon. And this Confederate general would come to Berlin to visit his daughter. Pretty cool. 
Anyway, she was from Atlanta, and she brought with her to Berlin, New Hampshire, a black nanny. People were pretty surprised by that. I can't tell you how very much she did for the people of Berlin, her granddaughter, Susan Brown Wheeler, said to me. Carolyn and her husband sent God knows how many bright children to college, including my mother and her three sisters, out of the goodness of her heart. She endowed a kindergarten. She brought soup to the workers when they were sick. There were always presents for the children at Christmas time. The Brown family donated the community club to the community. Had a gym, there it is, had a swimming pool, pool tables, a bowling alley. They built that, donated it, it was heated, got all its electricity from the pulp mill next door. The only expense to the town was management. The Browns were town people, so they cared what happened to Berlin. This is a family portrait. W.W. with the white beard. O.B. and Carolyn are standing behind him. And this is the nanny from Atlanta with Susan Brown Wheeler's father, Gordon Brown, just a baby. See the name Gordon comes through, Gordon Brown. Sub subsequent mill owners, big corporations like James River and Fraser, were not perceived as being as committed to the place or the people. But mill workers remained proud of their work. They thought of the mills uh, as theirs, as their own. During World War II, a soldier was stationed at the footbridge to the flock plant. You know what flock is? You eat it every day. It's cellulose. Flock is pulp refined to flour. And during World War II, it was used to make black powder. So it was of military interest. They put a soldier at the base of the footbridge and the, and the old timers complained because they had to show their badges to the soldier every time they went to work. <laughs> he knew I was Leo. I was Leo yesterday. I'll be Leo tomorrow. <laughs> this is my mill. When hard times came, and the mills had to be shut down temporarily. The men of their own volition took care of the machines so they would be ready to start up again. They would go in, they would sneak in, oil the machines, turn the valves, make sure those machines were in good shape. And the mills always started up again. Berlin was a company town. The mills provided, people worked hard, and they made good livings. We came here for work, and we found it. Those mills paid for our house, our food, nice cars, our cabin at the lake. Those mills put three kids through college. Here, a man, or in later years, a woman without a high school education could learn a skill and have a career. They could bid for better jobs and move up the ladder. The workers were proud of what they knew and what they could do as individuals and what they accomplished together. It was an apprenticeship system. You were scrutinized until you got it right. You could be running an 11-story boiler that could wipe out half the city. A lot of people think we're unskilled labor. It took a lot of skill to keep those places from blowing up. There was no school to teach these jobs. In public bathrooms, you'll remember this, all across the country, you used to find towel dispensers. You know those aluminum, those stainless steel towel dispensers marked Nibrock, which is Corbin spelled backwards. It's one of the first things I found out in Berlin. People love to tell you that. Nibrock. Corbin spelled backwards. That's the machine, or one of them. Corbin was the man who, in 1921, invented the machine that cut those brown paper towels for all those dispensers. When women first worked in the mills, it was almost exclusively in the towel room. Here's the gang. At one program, a woman came up to me afterwards and she said, when I got up this morning, I didn't know I was going to see my mother. And she looked at that picture and she found her mother. Lots of connections in this state. 
Jenny Parent worked in the towel room for many years. This is Jenny and her cousin Jackie Nedo, also of, of TV fame now, at the hospital where Jenny was laid up with pneumonia. When we met, she was almost 102 years old. Jenny said, for work at the mill, I did everything for the brown paper company. In the paper department, I worked sack roke. All the leavings from the cutting, we had to bag that sack roke. But I worked more in the label department. I was taking care of the labels on the finished paper. You know, how thick, what quality. When the towel room first opened, that's when I started. My girlfriend next door, she knew we had a lot of girls at our house, so she asked if I wanted to go. I had no work, I was 17 years old. Some people say to me, Jenny, where do you work? I say, towel room. They say, what do you do? I say, what do you think? Make paper. It's hard, hard work. But when you're young, you don't mind it. We packed 15 bundles in a case. When I started, the towel room had two machines. After a while, it got up to 14. Men loaded the machines, women packed the towels. You didn't run the machines, they say in Berlin. The machines ran you. They asked me, Jenny, what kept you going all those years? Why did you work so hard all those years? She said, for the money. <laughs> Same as everybody else. She said, I was bringing money home for 48 years. That's Jenny. If you got married, you lost your job. So I didn't get married. It was the rules. It had to be accepted. There's some good and bad in everything. After a while, I got an easier job in the cutter room. We had to count a lot, but we didn't have to work so hard. Norman Green worked all his life in the mills. Here's Norman. <coughs> he said, five generations of my family worked in the mills. The earliest was my great-great-grandfather, Nelson. Even though I tried to avoid the whole thing, Paper making was a family vocation. I'm the last of the hobo paper makers. The last of my kind. This is a story that Norman's father told him. Norman's father worked in the boiler room. And he said one night the big boss came around, you know, looking for trouble. <laughs> looking around, trying to find things wrong. And he looked down in the trough and he saw these packages wrapped in aluminum foil. So he picked up one of the packages and he peeled away the foil. And there was a six pack of beer. <laughs> the big boss became irate. He said to the little boss, I will not tolerate drinking on the job. Come Monday, any man caught drinking on the job will be immediately terminated. And the little boss said, you understand will be closed on Tuesday. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is, some did drink on the job. The truth is, much of the work in the mills was dangerous. As one man said, you went in, but you never knew if you'd come out on your own two feet when your shift was over. This is a picture of a digester that blew up what year, John? 1930. 18, 19, 1930, in which there were fatalities. It happened. It happened. Many died on the job. There were many more near misses. Rita Gagnon said, my husband almost got pulled into the, um, into the pulper by his wedding ring. But I was lucky, Louis said. The wire stuck to the bale and it caught under the ring, but I was lucky enough I could pull my hand free. A lot of close calls. When the machines broke, and a lot of people in Berlin missing digits. When the machines broke down, Robert Terrio got the call. He was the fixer, the millwright. One time he said, they call me over, they say, hey, the belt is off over there. I look. I say, what happened? What is this? I pick up a finger. Who owns this finger? One guy I saw.
saw him, I, I pulled him out of the machine. There was an up and down guard. Uh, he wanted to check his reel, but the guard wasn't big enough, and he put his hand over and it pulled him right in, and the roller grounded up his arm. He said, I had to take the guard off, pull him out of the machine, lay him down. Anyway, I said, geez, I hope they'll be able to save his arm. You could see all the nerves and stuff. But as soon as they take him away, the boss says, okay, get the machine going again. He's being taken care of. This was the mentality. It was a rough way, but that was our lives at the time. Remember Odette and the Joliet Snowshoe Club? Well, this is Robert Terrio, and he's holding a picture of his wife, Evelyn Flurquin Terrio. He said, she was a rare majorette. When she lifted her legs and swung her baton, I fell in a trap. <laughs> <laughs> Emily Flurcan was a majorette for a snowshoe club from Montreal. Robert played for Berlin Snowshoe Club. They met halfway in Sherbrooke at a convention. Because of a mix-up with the room reservations, Robert ended up sleeping on a couch in the mezzanine. On the train, he said, there had been much partying, so he was tired. He said, I go up the stairway, I throw my satchel underneath there, and bang, go to sleep after that big party on the train. He slept well until about 4 a.m. when balang, 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 a great ruckus in the lobby woke him. The train had arrived from Montreal, and the bands had marched from the train to the hotel, <laughs> playing. <laughs> he said, I had a hard time to open up both my eyes at once. <laughs> but he said, I looked down and the, the lobby was full. He scanned the crowd and across the lobby he spotted a beautiful majorette. He said, I couldn't believe it. I had never seen such a tall majorette like that. Evelyn was five foot nine, and she was standing on a step in high boots and wearing a tall hat. So I go over, Robert says, I work my way through the crowd, excuse me, excuse me. I took out my best French and asked if she was going to dance with me tonight at the ball. She said, okay, as long as you don't drink. <laughs> Unbeknownst to her, if I hadn't been half lit, I would never have gone so brazenly over to her. <laughs> the courtship lasted two years. They married in 1952. We were too much in love, Robert says. We had six kids in six years. When I met Robert and Evelyn, she was in the late stages of Alzheimer's, and he was caring for her at home. They were about to celebrate their 55th anniversary. Us people, he says, we take care of each other from way back. Robert worked hard to make conditions better for the mill workers. He was head of the union for a while, an advocate for fairness. They were segregated, he said. The Norwegians, the Swedes, they worked in the powerhouses. Cascade, stock reparation, Vita room, that was the domain of the Italians. There were some on a paper machine. Paper machines were a mix. Irish were on paper testing. The Russians worked as painters and roofers. Relatives hired relatives. He's told this story. He said Freemasons were the brick masons. He said we couldn't get in there because we were Catholic. The one that broke that was Morissette. He knew he could pick up bricks. He had watched them enough. He went to Littleton, he got the training. The standard was 100 cement blocks or 300 bricks in a day. He met the standard, he got the seniority, you gotta give him the job. He said, those guys were so doggone mad. Hey, back then I was prejudiced myself. Gladys had a problem because she was short. In the towel room, she had to work twice as hard as the other women because she was short, short arms, short Gladys. She wore the skin right off her hands. They said, we can't leave her on that job. She's spoiling the towels. <laughs> She's bleeding 
on the towel. <laughs> so they gave her a job sweeping. The women in the towel room, Robert Terrio said, they grabbed towels eight hours a day and were paid less than the men. At first, it would hire only unmarried women. If they married, they were out. <laughs> and they mellowed. It was okay to be married. But if they became pregnant, out. Then they mellowed more, and the women could take time off for pregnancy and come back. Robert said, I was familiar with the national law. I went to the union. Women are tired of working in the towel room. They should be able to work in other parts of the mill for equal pay. And some brave women, including Evelyn Flercantario, signed a complaint and we went to a meeting with equal opportunity from Washington and the bosses at the mill. It wasn't just the bosses the women were fighting. It was the union, too. A friend of mine says to me about my wife, why don't she stay home and wash dishes like everybody else? <coughs> but the law was on our side. When Evelyn got a job in paper testing, she had to work down in the cellar, in the deepest part of the mill. And the man who was training her said, there's a lot of rats down here. <laughs> Robert said, well, there were rats, but they were rarely seen. Eveline said, I'm not afraid of rats. As a rule, small animals can't eat big animals. <laughs> the mills were a world unto themselves. Cascade, which is down Gorham Way, was a little city inside the city of Berlin. You work 12 hours, you don't see the outside. You couldn't leave your machine. You used to go there with your lunch, and you left with your lunch. In the 50s, a good deal of money went into trying to avoid stream and air pollution. It was bad. The river foamed. Been to Berlin? The smoke was so acrid there were no black flies or mosquitoes. <laughs> Donna Larson played field hockey for the high school. She said, we used to win all our home games. <laughs> if the score was close, we just prayed for a downdraft. <laughs> They said if you lived in Berlin, you didn't smell it. Or if you did, it was the smell of money. Somewhere between rotten cabbage and skunk. From certain angles, the smoke from the big stack made it look like Goose Eye Mountain was erupting. Little children thought they lived at the base of a volcano. <laughs> One of Louis Gagnon's first jobs was in the tank room. He said these rolls of recycled newspaper would go into the tank, 100 to 150 of them cores, they'd sink that down and put tar in, drain it all out, and fill it with water. When they opened the cover, like a clam steamer, all that haze and mist would come out. They used to give us cold cream to put on our faces so we didn't burn. I was walking to work one day on the railroad tracks. My face was burning like somebody put a blowtorch on it. I said to hell with this. I said to the guy, if this is all you got for me, I don't want it. He said, I went back a year later. They put me in the tube mill. I made my mind up I'd stick with it. I was married then. This is Louie and Rita. Rita said at Bermaco where Louie worked, they got so dirty, the men were all tan. There were no white faces. They killed themselves in that tube mill. She said, I washed his clothes separate. I would never wash them with mine and the kids. She said, five out of ten in my family had cancer. In his family, three or four. I don't know. How much that has to do with pollution from the mills, who knows. Rainy Terrio, there he is. I never knew R-E-N-E -E was pronounced rainy till I went to Berlin. Rainy Terrio. You get some gas, he said, and you cough and cough. Back then, we had only the full face masks. Of course, they worked, but somebody tries to talk to you. You lift up your mask so you can hear them, and you get the gas. He said, I threw up many a lunches. One time, he said, I had to wear a full face mask in the control room because there was a leak underneath. My supervisor says, 
we'll fix that leak the next time we shut down. I said, uh, next time we shut down? He says, yeah, that's right. I pushed the button. <laughs> Ourselves. We had to write down everything we did so they'd know how to start up. So we wrote it all down, just like we were told, and then we put the paperwork in our lockers, locked them up, and walked out. <laughs> we were out for three days. It was three cents on the contract, but we knew they weren't going to start the mill without us. Three generations of mill workers. Marcel Levy in the middle with his father Rainey and son Tim. Marcel worked as a chemist in research and development. With a high school education, he worked beside people with PhDs, or as he says, men with doctrines. <laughs> he said, he told this story, he said, for a while, we had to pick up samples of the pulp every two hours. They wanted us to pick up samples every two hours, put them in a baggie. Someone would pick it up in the morning and take it to Cascade for a smell test. We were curious, were they really doing a smell test? So my friend took about a half a bottle of aqua velva <laughs> and dumped it on this one sample. The next day they called up, have you changed anything in the cooking process? <laughs> Why you ask? Well the pulp smells a lot different. It's what we think we might like the pulp to smell like. <laughs> they never got the pulp to smell like aqua velva. But ironically, by the time the mills were closing for good, many of the most serious environmental problems had been solved. Marcel worked 33 years in the mills. And last I heard, he was at Cascade, but I know in the last month or so that too has closed. So he is another one of the displaced mill workers. Uh, Rainey worked 42 and a half years in the mills, and Tim worked two summers. Marcel said, my youngest son didn't get a chance to try out the mill, but I'm glad my oldest did. Now he feels bad for his dad. <laughs> he knows what it's like to work instead of sitting behind a computer. He'd come home at night, put his head on the table, and fall asleep. I met Roland Olby at his place of work, Isaacson Steel. He was lucky. He found a new job after the mills had the big closure in 2001. <laughs> Roland managed the flock plant, the last of just four managers in the history of the flock plant. Flock, you eat it every day. It's used as filler in food and pharmaceuticals. Steel balls beat the cellulose to flour, and this it becomes this fluffy, floaty stuff that sticks to everything, including people. Roland said the bosses never bothered them at the flock plant. They didn't like the dust. The research department, he said, experimented with different uses for flock. One summer, it was popsicles. Three batches. One with no flock, one with a little flock, and one with more flock. We could eat all the popsicles we wanted. We just had to fill in, you know, which we liked the best. That summer, he said, I hired a couple of new guys. They bid onto the jobs. It was an awful hot summer. And they liked those popsicles. After a while, though, no more popsicles. We weren't testing popsicles anymore. I got a grievance. Where's the popsicles? Well, they were testing something else. The guy who filed the grievance calmed down after we got the donuts. <laughs> Roland said, when the flock plant was sold, it was the only division in James River that was making money. But they sold it. Their idea was, if you've got a house with a pool, sell the pool, you still got the house. We were non-strategic. At the time, this is what happened, Flock was going into dog chow, and the dog chow company said, if you don't sell us the flock plant, we'll take away the packaging for the dog chow. 
Why did the flock plant close? Roland said management played poker with the big boys and lost. During our interview, I noticed that beautiful onyx ring that Roland was wearing. He said he inherited it from his father and wore it only on special occasions. I said, Roland, you wore it today. What's the occasion? He said, you asked me to tell my stories. When the mills closed, nobody asked us to tell our stories. We think of September 11, 2001 as a turning point in American history, but for Berlin, September 10, 2001 was also a turning point. And I think those dates are forever linked in their minds. That was the day they put the locks on the doors. Everybody can tell you where they were that day and what they were doing. Here's what the people of Berlin say about the end of an era. We saw it coming all that summer. People couldn't cash their payroll checks. They get the check run to the bank because it might bounce. They said, how can your heart be in your work if you don't know if you'll have a job tomorrow? Norman Cowett said, my last job at the mill was cooking the wood. One night I was sitting at the computer and an alarm goes off. I wasn't getting enough softwood chips in the mix. So I call the guy that's supposed to be feeding the chips. I thought maybe he was taking a nap or you know, nature called. Where are the chips? I says. There's no more. I only need a couple tons. Norm, there's no more. I didn't know the yard was empty. There really was no more. The mill was shutting down temporarily, they said, but, I, but when I walked out, I said to the men, take a good look. We may never come back. During the shutdown, a lot worked out of town. Some were getting $25 an hour in the south, but they all wanted to come home. Rolanda Duchesne said, I felt lucky to marry a man from the mill. If you married a man from the mill, you were set for life. She said, eating got us through the rough times. The day I found out the mill closed, I went out and bought a case of canned milk. I don't even use canned milk. I filled the freezers, I filled the cupboards. When you get low on food, then you begin to worry. She said, we thought we had a level of security. House paid. Kids grown. When the mill closed, the savings went to medicine. 450 a month. All of a sudden, people had to pay $895 a month for emphysema. For one month, people with cancer stopped their treatments. Ola Olson said, I worked in the mill since 1970 in the power plant until I was chief boiler operator until they kicked my little rear end out shut the lights out when I went out the door. The average age of the men laid off was 54. What do men at that age do? No education. Some of them couldn't read or write. The mill was all they knew. Rolla Dobie said, my last day at the flock plant was the saddest day of my life. They push you to the end. They close the doors. Every rug you ever knew is pulled out from under you. In 2007 and 2008, the mills were torn down and the stacks, all but one, blown to smithereens. The people of Berlin realized this time the mills would not be coming back. My father worked there, my brothers, my sisters, even my granddaughter when she was going to Plymouth. When I crossed the bridge and looked down river, there's so much gone. There's nothing left to preserve. They said, don't go back. Best to leave it alone. Remember it the way it was. Gina Balanchi said, driving into Berlin from Milan one night, I looked and I saw all these lights. I said, what are those lights? Then I realized they were the street lights on the east side. I never saw them before. There was a mill in the way. <laughs> Mr. Brown came here with a vision, and he accomplished his vision, but nobody says, thank you, Mr. Brown. What's sad is 200 years of heritage and paper-making history gone. 
We just feel so betrayed. The mills were a lifeline. What else they was in Berlin? What else they is? This poem hung on the wall of the Burgess Mill during its last days. It's by David Arsenal. <coughs> Goodbye, old friend. My great-grandparents were with you in the beginning. My grandparents, too, walked through life with you, as did my mother and my father. And I'm sure you remember my father-in-law left his life right here within your embrace. But it is now goodbye, old friend, for fate has it that I will not pass this way again. Always remember I stayed with you to the end in honor of all those who dedicated themselves to the mill. I used to end this program there, but it's too sad. So I push on a little bit to look to the future. Because some, they're looking, you know? They're looking. Something's going to happen. The mill. It's all your generations. It's what kept you alive. And yet, as Jenny Parent said, in my life, I've seen better times. But it has to be accepted. There's some good and bad in everything. There's a lot of rumors going around, but I don't pay much attention. If the ATV park gets going, that's some jobs. The young people, if they can get into the new prison, they'll be all set. Why don't the town fathers do something for the tourism? You know what this area needs, Merle Cole said? It needs a good road. The people of Berlin are very friendly. Besides that, they're giving. If anyone has hardship, the people of Berlin are there to help. We had a house that burnt with two families in it. That night, the people came over and brought the families to their house and let them use their apartment for free. There didn't used to be any ice on the river by the dam because of the chemicals. Foam a foot high. Now you see ducks and everything. Everybody's in the same boat. Berlin will come back, maybe not in my lifetime. And that's repeated. Maybe I won't see it, but Berlin will come back. We've been through tough times before. We've survived. And finally, I'm not leaving. I'm dying here in Berlin. This is my country. We're here for the long haul. That's the story of Berlin. No one ever leaves unless they have to. It's a grand old city. Thank you. They're your family, that's who they are. We lost them, you know? 
Well, that's what they it's, say in it, Berlin that. Um, it's been a long time, but they, you know, it still bothers me. It's been almost 20 years. Well, they had the Converse rubber up in Berlin. Converse. Did they have it in, uh, in uh, And uh, a lot of people worked there, work there too. Yes. And, uh, they would say, you know, it was and it, a family we all knew, everybody's kids. The kids had to behave because eyes were always watching. You know, the family was always watching, and the family was really the whole town, the whole community. Yeah. You know, the shoe trucks did the same thing. The shoe trucks got people there, they paid for people's homes, they bought their cars, sent their kids to college, and they got the second home, too. But when, uh, when I got in on the end, we had nothing. <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. And I worked 32 years for nothing. Yeah. Do you see any of those people ever? I saw one of them who has a relative who lives in this town. She lives in Belmont. Uh, several, but maybe 10, 15 years ago. It was so, such a pleasure to see her. Your family. Thank you yeah. very much. What's your name? Rachel Burke. Nice to see you, Rachel. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's uh, people will say it's not just the Berlin factory. It's not, not just the Berlin. It's any of those. It's just a whole It's any thing. of that it's where you sad. had the manufacturing, you had people working closely together, doing skilled jobs, proud of their work. You know, company town. The company took care of us, and then it's gone. And then it's gone. It's a very sad story. It's a story of this country, really. Anybody else want to have a question or have a comment or a story? Thank you, Rachel. I just like to have this note. I have more. Go ahead, Rachel. Oh, okay. Uh, so Rachel's back up. I'm sorry. <laughs> Don't be sorry. This is uh, what we I, I work I was brought I was born and brought up in Summersworth. Summersworth was a mill town like like Farmington like was. Anyway, uh, we had Years ago, I guess when they started with the mills, it was apparently it was common for uh, for the mill owners to build to build housing for the bosses and, and you know the better people. And we had some beautiful housing that was torn down in the 60s uh, when when they uh, renewed renewed urban renewal. Urban yeah. renewal. We had we were going. My husband and I were going through the the town, and I happened to look in the rear view mirror of the, the car. And I says, you know, I says, this looks like an English village. There were big, beautiful brick buildings. They tore it down, and I'm like, how could they do such a thing? A lot of beautiful houses. And most of the housing that Summersworth had built was colonial. So it was really John nice. John says there are a couple people here from Berlin. Is that right? No. Are you from Berlin? No. Oh, no. no. You want to talk? You want to tell us? Do we speak true or is this all mythology? No, it's not. Are you live in Berlin now? Do we live in Berlin now? Yeah. We live in Farmington. But you were we're from Berlin originally. Yeah, we're and, what, and what are your names? Uh, Mark. Mark. Paul. Paul. Oh, Paul. Paul. So you're both from Berlin? Yeah. So Mark, you married a Berlin girl? Yes, I did. I they say that. they say in Berlin, there's nothing like a Berlin girl. <laughs> Story. And they say, watch out for those girls from Gorham. One couple said, we're, we're a mixed marriage. I'm from Berlin. She's from Gorham. <laughs> <laughs> so tell, 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 what, do you have questions for them? Or what do you want to say? This is so interesting. All our families in Berlin. Yeah. All right. yeah. so I'm old brothers, sisters, very large family. How are they doing? Doing very well. Yeah, there's there's too many left in Berlin. Most of them left because there's no work, like you're saying. Um, I come from a very large family. There's eleven kids in my family, brothers and sisters. My mom had a very large family, thirteen. Most very Catholic families. So, yeah. 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 Were they all born at the end of the year? <laughs> Some memories back for you. Oh, very nice. Yeah. yeah. Well, why? 
the picture is, I don't know if you're the one that took it from the 12th Street Bridge looking down toward the mill. That's, um, that's Eric. That's Eric. Yeah. 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 So I, if you were looking at those pictures to the left hand side, that's where I grew up. Yeah. My parents owned one lot up the river. So we grew up playing in the woods that you could see there. Yeah. Fishing in the water. Stay right away from the river, right? right. Stay away from the river, and that's where you went. That's where you went. Directly to the river. Or up on that mountain, Mount Forest. Mount is Forest, it? Mount Jasper. Mount Jasper. Yeah. Uh, some, uh, someone said that when they were kids, they'd go up on Mount Forest and just ran wild because it was fine. It was perfect. It was a very safe town. Everybody watched everybody else. And when the uh, whistle blew, the whatever, the mill whistle maybe for five o'clock, all the kids would run down the mountain and come right straight down the face of it because they had to get home. So, so their lives were regulated by the mill as well, even as children. Yeah. My, father, my father worked there for over 40 years at the mill. And it's, it's really fascinating. At this point now, he's in his 70s and not as good health, but... You know, we would walk down paths when they were taking the mill down. Oh. And his memories kind of going, so I would hear the same story several times every time I went up. But it was good because then I could learn the stories. But, so we would walk down through there, and he could explain the entire process of the paper making because he had worked in so many of the different departments. And there was just a lot to it. And, you know, the men, all the, all the people that worked there took incredible pride in the work that they yeah. did. And that worked a lot of hours. Oh, double okay. shift, double shifts all the time. He worked Christmas for triple time, holidays. Where's, where's, uh, well, his name is Brother. I call him Brother. And uh, I said, Where's Brother? Why? Well, he's working at the mill. He's pulling a double. So you work two 12 hour shifts. You go around, around the clock. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Two eight hour shifts. I heard about so he the 12 hour shifts. Some, yeah. of, the, some of the, um, I can't remember if it was Rita or um, Rolanda, but. They said it was very hard on the kids because the dads work so hard and they do those double shifts and then they'd have to sleep during the day. And so the kids would have to tiptoe around so they wouldn't wake dad up. And he just wasn't there. You know, he wasn't there. And they there. worked rotating the shifts. So they would have one week during the day, one yeah. week evening yeah. and one weekend night. Yeah. That was tough. And I also know that during the depression they didn't lay anybody off. They just cut the hours. They cut everybody's hours and they kept everybody on. That's the kind of really was a kind of community, kind of family. Who would you lay off? Uncle Bill? Yeah. No, you can't let him go. It, it, went, it, 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 it doesn't get more fair than that. Cutting the hours down for everybody. Yeah. yeah. Instead of throwing, you, you're like, you know. Yeah, yeah. 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 And the lady that looked next door to us, who remained single for her whole life, she worked in the research. And, um, told the stories more to my dad than to me, but you know, of course she worked really hard and they would do some really interesting work, but the male bosses of course would do things that they were That sounds about right. Yeah. That sounds yeah. She's about probably, right. you know, like 85, 90 yeah. at this point. So, you know, she worked there for many, many years in the, in the research department. Yeah, and that's what, they did some amazing things. Yeah. John's been researching the kind of the inventions that they had and the advances Purple. in technology. Yeah. It's just, we, I think he listed some of them. It was the Crispy um, Girls in there. The Crispy Girls. The Crispy Girls. The Crispy yeah. Cream Girls. The Crispy Cream Girls, yeah. 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 They worked on the Crispy Cream, which was the predecessor to Shortening. Shortening, to Crisco. Shortening, to Crisco. Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, right. They invented yeah. Crisco. They actually had a. In Berlin, New Hampshire, that's right. Yeah, that's they, right. they had a right huge. Uh, so uh, that was legal the legal some process created this. John, come up so people can hear you. Crisco, buddy. Well, I'll be up here pretty soon. Everybody come up. It's good. But John, there was a big bat, a legal bat. Yeah, there was a, Crisco was invented a oh, couple this. years before, before Krispy Kreme. Yeah. But they didn't file for a patent in time. And Berlin filed their patent, and their patent was approved about a year before Crisco. Okay. And so Crisco took them to, to Court and it went all the way to the Supreme Court. It took about ten years, and in 1920, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Berlin. Of Bronco. 
So they got the patent for the, the original hydrogenated well, vegetable oil. But why do we have Crisco yeah. now and not Krispy Kreme? Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it was bought out. Eventually. Oh, then they uh, sold it. Years later. Yeah. <laughs> they sold the pool and kept the house. The other thing was, so you're talking about how people, you know, stuck together and they didn't lay people off during the Depression. Um, Brown Company actually, th during the 1933 to 35, was really bad for them because of the Depression. And they, had a, they couldn't afford to send men out into the woods to cut the wood. Ah. So the city of Burley and the state of New Hampshire put up the money to pay the crews to go out and cut the lumber. And Berlin made the paper and then shared the profits with the city. Oh, interesting. Oh. So they kept them going yeah. through the hard times. Yes. Companies aren't like that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's a corporate yeah. municipal yeah. partnership. Yes. And the Brown Company, you know, they really yeah. did take care of the community and the investment. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And I didn't even really think about the connection until you said that. I mean, I went to kindergarten. Yeah. You know, how many towns in the country had yeah. kindergarten at that time? Yes. You talked about the community club? Yeah. That's where I learned how to swim in the community club. It was still there and existing when I was young. Yeah. We went there and we went and hung out. We played candle pin bowling. They had a uh, basketball court. They had an indoor <coughs> track. It was big. Big, yep. Huge pool. Way before, we all learned how to, you know, swim. It was a real center of the community. Yeah, yeah. Community it was huge. Club, all yeah, from the Brown that. family. They saw a need and yes. uh, filled it. They wanted their people to be happy. And yeah. I heard from, I can't tell you how many kids who are now adults who were friends with some of the Brown sons. Yeah. And they said, oh, we'd go over to the Brown house and we'd have lunch. Fifteen of us. We'd all have lunch and then we'd go out sliding and they really were of the community. They weren't separate from the community. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, the thing that I said, and it's sort of interesting to hear in your presentation, is that I really think it went down when they stopped research. Because then you're just trying to keep a particular process going. Yeah. And when you close down all of your research, then you don't have positive yeah. growth anymore. And, and But you see that in many places around the country. If you travel and hear about the stories and communities, like we went, What's the town that my brother lives in? In Lockport. Lockport. Lockport New York, right York. near Niagara Falls. And we went to a tour there. Amazing the things that they invented. Ways of using the water for power. Just amazing. Yeah, like true. green. Green as could be. I mean, sure. And why those sorts of things went away and the research went away. Yeah, they, it's kind of they, interesting. They cut, the, they cut back on the research department in the 50s when they were trying to uh, make the Plant more, the company more efficient, oh. and they just did a, like a meat axe across everybody, including research and development. And, and uh, ten years later, the directors were saying, "Well, we got to beef up R and D because we're falling behind these other companies that need these inventions." A question that often comes up is, you know, what happened? And it's yeah. there's so many answers to that. I mean, we're John and I are trying to think about it together and, and bring lots of other voices into it. But I, I didn't talk to anybody who had an answer to that. <laughs> there is not an answer to that. Because you still have a whole large global. There are many there are many answers to that. And was it inevitable? Who knows? But a uh, lot, a lot of factors. You know, bad decisions or misguided decisions early on and just the whole changes in, in how things are made and cheaper to make to grow trees in the south and cheaper to transport them and it's really complicated what happened to that company. It was really good in the twenties, it was the heyday. And the, when the depression hit, it was like a death spiral. They couldn't make the money to maintain the machinery, so the machinery went bad and they weren't making money. So by the time they went bankrupt in thirty five and started getting funds to uh, get them back on their feet. The cost to bring the mill back was so great that they never really, they never really did it. They never could really afford it. Yeah. Couldn't find the money. And then, of course, other things happened. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. Oh, you're welcome. Does anybody else want to chime in? I hear a voice back there. No, that's him. Do you want? Do you have? You no. Know, you have something to say. You know something. What? Used to be in the old days. What yeah. What happened in the old days? What happened? Well, I worked in a grocery store and, yeah. used to, and I have a safe and the shoe workers would go down and cash their checks. 
And the money never left the area. Yes, yes. And they, they just had an amount of money, operating money, it never left the area because the people spent it in the place. Absolutely, and that's they, right. And they had to worry about getting yeah. robbed because just a few, last few years when they took the sink away because it was checks, it wasn't money. It was yeah. Checks. Oh, that's interesting. Well, that was pretty interesting. There's a man named Tony Harp in um, Verlin. I don't know if you knew Tony, but he, um, wonderful man. He had served in the in the military and intelligence, just a brilliant, brilliant man. But when he was, a, he told about his dad, and his dad, Tony was Lebanese. Then his dad, I think, I mean, he's first generation, but his dad and mom came to Berlin for the work because they knew the money, the local money was there. And so they set up, he set up a little grocery truck. His dad would drive around delivering groceries and was, was very profitable for many years because there was a lot of money. But he said when Tony was little, he would ride around in the truck. And when, um, when he got tired, he would climb up on a shelf and go to sleep. And it was the banana shelf. So one day a lady said, don't mistake Tony for bananas. <laughs> but it, you know, it was, there was a whole, so many businesses that were supported by the mills and the mill workers. The, at one time, Berlin had the highest per capita income in the state. Highest per capita, not Manchester, not Nashua, not Portsmouth, <coughs> Berlin. They were making money, making good money, and supporting a lot of other, you know, a lot of other people in the process. So, very good point. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment or a question? Or oh, I, I want to say this was my favorite night. Oh, wait, it's on tape. This is one of my favorite <laughs> nights <laughs> of presenting this program because of what you all brought to it. So thank you so much. And I really appreciate your attentiveness and uh, the comments that you've made. So. And go to Berlin. Spend some money. <laughs> <laughs>